Hello and welcome back to Advancing Spark, where yes, we're having a double whammy of videos for this week. Mainly because Databricks have only gone and given us a double whammy themselves. So I was still running around all excited for Spark 3 going, yeah, Databricks Runtime 7's out, get with it. Um, and then I looked and see, well, there's now 7.1 and 7.2. So there's a whole load of new features in Databricks that kind of snuck out while we're looking at the raft of new features that came out just last month. So I thought I'd do a bit of a news video. Let's have a look at these new runtimes. Let's have a look at the new features. There is some cool stuff like cloning, which I thought was like, yeah, okay. And then thinking about it, there's really, really cool stuff in there. And I'll show you roughly how it works and kind of what we need to do with it. So like the video, don't forget to like and subscribe as always, but let's dig in. Okay, so what we're looking at, Databricks 7.1. So it is around, it's released. So this is now a live runtime. This is now the current um, GA runtime looking at. What have we got? So there's the big query connector. Now, I'm very Microsoft. I'm over in Microsoft land in Azure. I don't use BigQuery that much. But one of the problems that we've always had is being able to connect these different cloud platforms together has always been a bit of a struggle. And that's one of the criticisms that Google's had in the past is getting stuff in and out of BigQuery can be a bit good. So great to get data in there. Really, really powerful doing stuff. But then getting out. Like... Whereas being able to plug it straight into Databricks. So even if you are doing cross-platform and you've got AWS, you've got Azure, whatever you're doing, being able to query into BigQuery, get data out of it, actually really cool. So really, really good. I'm not going to use it that much myself, but just more compatibility, more integration points is just fantastic, right? Obviously, I'm more interested in the Delta Lake stuff. So, commits. Now, this sounds like a little innocuous thing, but being able to set user defined commit metadata, essentially, every time you do a Delta operation, just being able to put a little tag. This is me doing today's load, this daily load. I'm reversing a problem I made yesterday. Oh, this is me doing the major update. I'm doing an optimize to fix this problem. And being able to just put that in your code. So when you look at your Delta tables history, you've got these commits, kind of like a GitHub commit message going, I'm checking this in because I made a problem. This is the same kind of thing. So being able to have user commenting in the history of your table is awesome. So now we're going from the point when you didn't used to be able to have any kind of transactional logging, transactional control at all uh, in a date, data lake to actually we've got quite advanced user logging. This is the full history of everything anyone's ever done with their username, with the cluster ID, and now with a commit message. So that's really, really cool. Definitely good. Some things making it easy to pull out the latest version, all that kind of stuff. Converting to Delta from streaming tables used to be quite hard. If you're streaming into a parquet table, you, you had to kind of stop it, pull it apart, create a new Delta table, repoint it, rebuild things. Now you can kind of just say, well, actually, I've got a checkpoint, convert it over, go from that checkpoint, turn it back on again. So that's kind of cool. I don't know how often you'll be doing that kind of thing. How often do you have a stream that's enabled and then change your mind and decide it's now Delta? But there might be some awkward juggling where you've suddenly decided you have to move this and it can't go down, and then you move it over. As I know, I'd say there's a small chance that the last micro batch might be committed again, which I'm sure will terrify people into not using it, but... Again, it's, it's there. And there's some performance improvements for Merge. And Merge has had some wonky performance in the past. So anything we're doing that actually improves that, especially with the just matched ones, which is good. That's great. So again, all good stuff we're getting in 7.1. Then the other one we saw is this um, notebook scoped Python libraries. So the ability to say, not the, I want this whole cluster now to get this additional library and I need to restart Python on there, and so I lose my Python context for everyone who's using it. But actually, just for the notebooks in my current session, anything I'm calling for my current session, install this library. So it's like a temporary pip install that's not going to affect your overall environment, which is awesome. And that's using the percentage pip commands. So digging into that, there's a few different bits and pieces. This isn't brand spanking new, because it was around in 6.4 ML. So it's kind of like enabling it, making it more mainstream, plugging it into the rest of um, the Databricks runtimes. And again, you've got that choice of using the Databricks, the dbutilities.library or the percentage pip and percentage conda. But again, it's just normalizing it, it's putting it out there, it's making it, again, more just user-friendly, more uh, able to use it. So yeah, definitely, definitely awesome, definitely makes things useful. Again, conda, maybe that's more of a data science thing. 
a lot of the big scientists I know use it. I don't know how many engineers who do conda based things because ten, you tend to have, this is my cluster, I'm doing everything on, you set your cluster up deliberately. It's quite rare in the uh, engineering terms that you'd say, here's my cluster, I've set it up, except for that one job that uses a different library. But again, because it's quite new, maybe should, we haven't normalized those patterns yet. But that, really, really cool. Uh, definitely, definitely some good use cases. And finally, well not finally, two more things. One, a new display. So kind of the, the way we normally do display, so you do display brackets and you put a data frame or whatever you want to render inside it, you can now chain it onto the end of things. So if you're saying data frame dot filter dot whatever dot aggregate group by dot display and have it as a chain of commands and I push it out. And that kind of fits uh, as well into pandas and koalas. So if you're doing what's in that kind of language and it makes more sense to have that built into it, you can do that. Again, nice little quality of life change. And Koalas is now installed by default. So Koalas, that's our Spark-friendly version of Pandas. So if you're using Pandas before, didn't scale that well, went outside of the JVM, all of that kind of stuff in, um, in Spark. Koalas is the Spark native version where it'll scale properly, it'll use the executor properly, won't go outside the JVM, and the syntax is meant to have full parity. It's not full parity, about what, 60, 70, 80% parity, depending on the area. But that's now default, uh, installed by default. So we'll start seeing that normalized. You don't have to, it's not a special thing. You need to remember to install it or you can send it to PIP to install it. It's now just automatically installed. So good stuff. And then the usual gigantic pile of improvements, bug fixes, things from open source. So 7.1 on its own, quite cool. Few little incremental changes, some quite nice things in there. So 7.2 is also out. So 7.2 is in beta. You can currently go into a cluster, switch it to 7.2 mode, and then get all of this stuff. And so obviously that might change. It might be a bit flaky. Don't use it for production. But having a look at some stuff, you can only go and clone, clone a date delta tape. Um, as I said at the start, this is something I looked and I was like, okay, so I can, I can copy a table. Great. Um, and the real use case for me comes down to this ability to shallow clone. So we've got a whole concept of doing deep or shallow clones, and that depends whether you want to just take the translog, the metadata, or whether you want to take the data as a whole. And if that sounds confusing, it's because it is. So let me just grab a quick description. I said I'll kind of have a run through, say, what does this actually mean? How does this work? So I made a quick runtime 7.2, attack of the clones thing. Let's have a look at this. So. Got my sales table, got a load of parquet files, and I got my transaction log sitting in my delta log. So just a normal delta table working as it normally does. So as usual, if I make an update, so I'm, that update's hit three of my um, parquet files, and I've got three new parquet files. So again, remember that delta is append only. So any change you make, it just adds new files that represent the new state. And then in the transaction log, it says, don't look at these old files anymore. So they're logically marked as old, obsolete, deleted, whatever you want to call it. They're not physically deleted, they're still there. Okay, so that, that's essentially core normal delta. So if I query that, it just means my query ignores anything the transaction log tells it is old. So transaction log just says, there's a whole bunch of files in here. These are the ones relevant to your current state. And that's how we can do time travel by saying, actually, show me the old state, which means it will still include the old files and not the new files. All of that stuff is delta. So shallow clone does this. It says, well, actually, I'm going to leave the data in situ, but I'm going to create a new copy of that transaction log. So I've got two different tables. So I can go and query one table, and it'll have the same things. It'll still know, don't look at the old files. These set of um, files on your new files. This is what you want to go and query. Um, and it's slightly weird in that as soon as it's cloned, they're then two different things. So if I go and insert into either one of my tables, if I do an insert or an update transaction, that's going to change the files that's currently live, active for that delta table. But the other one won't have had that update. And so that transaction log will no longer be in sync. So if, I, if I've inserted into my top one, that's got some new parquet files. I query my bottom one. That doesn't know about those two new parquet files, and so it doesn't query them. So at the point when you create that shallow copy, they diverge, and then you've got two different copies that can be making their own updates, making their own changes, and they're just adding more and more files into that directory, but they don't actually get in each other's way. 
And that's kind of cool. Um, and again, you know, when I looked at it, I was like, yeah, fine. But what could I use that for? And then as I sat there thinking what I can use it for, I came up with like five, six, seven different use cases. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe that's quite useful. You know, anything from quick disaster recovery to rolling back. Oh, actually, what, what would happen if we rolled back to there? Let's create a copy. I've got a massive update I need to do. Let's do the update, see if it works. If it doesn't, you just trash that transaction log and it doesn't matter. You know, so creating like a replica that has the same data, but without the overhead of copying all the data. That's really quick. So being able to spin up four different versions of the same table, apply different versions of your update. I mean, so we could do things like um, budgeting with different models. So I've got my massive financial table. I say, what happens if I apply to this model, this model, this model, and this model? I can spin up clones, apply them separately, look at the results, and then trash the ones I don't like. That's cool. So loads of things we can do with shallow copy that is kind of more than it originally seems. Um, bit of a warning. So if I do an update, so if I do something that's going to render some of my old files obsolete, so this one, so it's got picked three files that's getting updated, it's created the new Parquet file, whatever the change I'm doing happens to be. Uh, and then I run a vacuum. Now vacuum is that command that looks at the transaction log, it looks at the files in the actual directory, and then it gets rid of files it doesn't need anymore. It goes, well, all these ones are obsolete, I can just get rid of these, it's a nice garbage collector. Um, and that means you can't do temporal queries beyond that point. However, because we've now got two separate transaction logs, pointing at the same place. If I try and query the other one, it'll try and query it. Some of the files it's expecting to be there are no longer there, and the whole thing's gonna blow. So I'm gonna get just an error going, no, there's no files, it's all my transactional integrity's gone, what's going on in my life? So shallow copy, really, really cool. If you're running it for a long time with multiple shallow copies and you're vacuuming, then things are gonna break. Um, but for that kind of temporary test a few things, try a few things out, roll it back with no harm done, then it's really, really cool. On the other side of the fence, we've got deep copy. That's as you'd expect. It's not just copying the metadata of the transaction log, it's copying the data and the transaction log. It's saying, I want a full entire copy of this table, what and all, all the metadata, all the transaction log, all that stuff. I'm not dug into it yet. I've not had to play around with this in anger. So I don't know if it copies the obsolete files that you've not vacuumed yet. So you do get an element of time travel. I noticed the note saying that, you know, kind of the, the, the history will be different between the two. So I'm assuming it's only the active files, but I'll be digging into that and having a look at essentially the next level. Here are some use cases for um, cloning in another episode, I think. Okay, so deep clones make an entire separate copy. And that might take a while, because if you over a massive several terabyte huge table, you're essentially having to do a big full read of that data, write it down to somewhere else. That is going to be a fairly chunky activity. So it's cool. Great power, great responsibility, all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, Delta cloning actually cooler than I thought it would be. So if we go out of that, one thing to note in clones, so again, it's in preview, blah, blah, blah. It is currently SQL based. So like a lot of the Delta features, they tend to be SQL first. So the, all the syntax is currently SQL syntax. And I'm sure eventually we might see a Python, Scala, Java version of that syntax. But maybe like optimized currently, it'll just still be SQL only. I don't know whether this is going to be a Delta Lake release eventually and go into the open source Delta Lake, whether this is one of the Databricks um, proprietary elements of Delta. Don't know. All quite new, all brand new. But at least we can do this. So this is in the beta. If you spin up a cluster that's on uh, runtime 7.2, you can go and try out cloning. And again, you can do things. You've got your shallow or deep. You say you're cloning, you say where it's going to. Kind of the same as if you're going to create a new table. It's just your source is an existing Delta table. And again, as I was saying, you can get an existing Delta table at a given state. So I could actually say, do a load of stuff, make a load of updates, and then actually just clone it from the one three updates ago and make that my current one over there. So there are lots and lots of opportunities, lots of things we can have a play with, lots of things we can do. So if that sounds interesting, if it sounds useful, go and have a look at 7.2. Um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty cool and entirely unexpected. So I, would, I didn't have any clue that um, any of the cloning stuff had come in. That isn't something that you've been hearing about on the roadmap upcoming. So kind of a pleasant surprise with a load of different things. So we're kind of caught on the back foot going, uh, what could we 
what? <laughs> so, yeah, super useful. Have a look. And if you come up with any weird and wonderful uses for cloning and you find kind of a novel new thing of getting around something we've not been able to do before, let us know. Get in touch in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe the video and we'll be in touch again. Cheers.